Welcome, GDLers, to another edition of Scripting Adventure. This is Bruce from Barking Dog Bim, and today we're going to continue developing the desk we started in the last video by adding some parameter limitations to prevent the user from breaking the object, along with an options selection list for various corner configurations. We will also learn the basics of declaring and using an array, and how to have multiple lines of code on the one line. Let's get scripting. So make sure that you have your Edit GDL Library Parts toolbar turned on. And under your Options Work Environment Model Rebuild Options, Interrupt with Error Messages is turned on. So last video we created a nice simple desk. It's got parametric capabilities in the overall dimensions. So height, width, and depth can be changed by the user, as can some of the attributes. So if I change the surface to gold legs, you can see that that's changed. And if I change the tabletop to be a paint blue royale, there we go. We've got the capacity to do that. We have not allowed the user to be able to change some dimensions, such as tabletop thickness, leg diameter, leg offset. Those are fixed. However, we have the problem that the user can put in any dimension. What happens if they put in a parameter value that breaks the object, such as zero width? We get this error, and it breaks the object. So we need to limit the values that the user can put into this object to make sure that it doesn't break. I'll just reset this to default. This is where the values commands come into play. We'll open our object by selecting it and on the file menu, choose libraries and objects, open object. You can use the shortcut or you can use this button here on your toolbar, open object. We'll restore down using that button there. On a Mac, you can right click on the tab and choose undock. And we'll open our parameter script because that's what we're going to be working in. Let's open our help file, documentation, GDL reference guide. Or if you want the online version, it's gdl.graphisoft.com and reference guide. Now I've divided my parameter script up into these various categories. Pen check, values, hide, lock, and parameter exchange. This is not an ARCHICAD thing. This is something that I've developed over the time I've been writing GDL scripts. And once again, it just helps me organize my thoughts and keep my scripts nice and tidy. So what we want to do is add some limitations to the A, B, and Z, Z, Y, Z, X parameters to make sure that the user can't break the object. Values is found under non-geometric scripts, the parameter script, and values. Here it is, values, and you can see that there are three different ways that you can apply this command. We are only interested in the first method. The second two are how to limit either a fill parameter type or a complex profile parameter type. And the command line is values the parameter name in inverted commas, and one or more value definitions. The comma here in square brackets is only for use in certain applications. We have a look at how to define our value definitions. You can use an expression, so A plus B, for example. Custom means that although your value statement will list out options and ranges, if that word custom is in there, the user can enter any value. That does come in handy, believe it or not. Range is when you define a range between certain numerical values. And the delimiters, which are used on the left and right of your numerical values. The key to understand here is that square brackets means greater than or equal to, or in the closing delimiter, it's less than or equal to. And the round brackets means greater than or less than no equals to. And we can see here that it says if value definition one is a numerical expression with an explicit 
plus sign, the comma must be used. I've never used an explicit plus sign, and I don't know why you would, but there you go, is there. And the command line is values, in inverted commas, the parameter that you want to limit, the keyword range, we want to set our lower limit, and I'll just show you what happens with the square bracket, which is greater than or equals to zero, and there's no upper limit. So I'll just leave that blank and close it with the square brackets. And let's see what happens. We now have this limiter arrow beside the parameter. And if I click on it, you can see that the indicator is that it's got to be greater than or equal to zero. Now for our table, that's not what we want. We don't want the table to be so small that the legs cross over. So what we have in here is leg offset by two plus leg diameter by two. So we'll save that and see the result. If I squish this down, you can see that I am limited in how far I can go. So if I make that the smallest it can be, have a look in 3D. There we go, my legs are not crossing over. And I'm prohibited from doing so by the values statement that I added in the script. So let's just reset that to our default. And we'll now add those same limitations to our B parameter. And for our ZZYZX parameter, we want to limit it so that it doesn't get any smaller than the desktop thickness. We want it to be greater than the desktop thickness. So we'll go values, ZZYZX, range, and it's greater than desktop thickness and no upper limitation now when there's no upper limitation it doesn't matter if you use a square bracket or a round bracket let's have a look we can see i am limited to be greater than 35 millimeters and in here we can see that my desktop thickness is 35 millimeters if i was to change that to 40 come back to my height it's changed to be 40 to reflect the change to that variable. Now, while we're here, we'll also add a limitation to our GS Resolve. Values, GS Resolve. And what do we want that to be? We want that to be greater than or equal to 6. And in this case, we'll limit it to 36. Let's double check. Now, something to note about the parameter script, whenever you click out of the parameter script into your parameters, the script will compile. And so you'll know straight away whether it's working or not. I don't actually have to click on check script to compile it. As soon as I click into my parameters window, the parameter script will compile. Let's now add our options selection parameter. We want that to appear top level before any of the attribute selections. So I'll come up here, I'll go new, and I'll call it desktop type. We'll make it a text type, and we'll call this desktop type. Let's save that and have a look at what that does. There we go, we've got our new parameter, and it's just a text infield with no limitations, so I can put anything in there I want. Now, I haven't actually told the script to do anything with this parameter. It's just a dumb parameter at the moment. Now we want to add some options for this parameter. So we'll do this by going values, inverted commas, desktop type, And we don't want a range in this instance. We actually want to define the options. So we'll call it square as one option, rounded as another option, and chamfered as our final option. Let's see. There we go. There's our options. So our parameter is limited to those options we just created. Now let's put something in our 2D script to demonstrate that this is actually working. So right at the top here, I'll put in a text to command so I can see what's happening. 
So the X and Y coordinates are 0, 0 and the content will be desktop type. We'll save that. Have a look. Now, because I haven't run the parameter script since I've limited what that desktop type content can be, as I showed in a previous video, that won't take effect until I run the parameter script. And to run the parameter script, I just need to open the object settings. Like so. There we go. It's updated. Click OK. And my parameter script has run. And the parameter limitation has now taken effect. So my option is square. If I change it to rounded, it's changed. And if I change it to chamfered, there we go. So my selection is working. That parameter is working. However, using text to define a selection parameter or an options list parameter is not best practice. And I'll demonstrate why. Let's change this 2D script. Instead of just outputting the value of that parameter, I'll put in a conditional statement. So if desktop type equals, now I've got to go, what was it again? What did I type? Oh, I better go back to my parameter script and check. What did I type? Oh yeah, right, square. Okay, if desktop type equals square, then, then it'll do my statement here. So what do we want to do? Let's go text to, just so that we know it's different, let's do one. So if desktop type is square, then we'll do one. That will be zero, zero, one. Let's add our conditional statements for our other two options. What was the next one? It was rounded. What was the next one? It was chamfered. Here we go. So one, two, three. I just need to add in equals here. Equals, equals. Comment out my text to statement. There we go. This is option three we're at. We'll create another two copies so that I can demonstrate how this is a bad way to do things. Square, which is one. Rounded, which is two. And this should be chamfered, which is three. So that's working, right? That seems fine. Doing what I want. What happens now if, for whatever reason, I need to change one of these descriptions? It's not what we want anymore. Maybe instead of square, it's squared. Rounded is curved. And chamfered is cut edge. Who knows what the reason might be, but it needs to change. When I come back to my floor plan, if I change anything about this, it no longer works because my if statements are now no longer valid. Not meant to be looking for square anymore, it's meant to be looking for squared. So that's what you have to do to get it to work again. You change any of these values, you have to find them everywhere you've used them and use the correct spelling again to make any of your code work again. That's method one of how to create your selection lists. The next method is to use the values to statement. Believe it or not, values two is found just under values one. It's to be used with number type parameters. So angle, length, real, which is a decimal number not associated with any measuring unit, and integer type parameters. You can't use it associated with a text type parameter, a fill type, complex profile, line type, any of those other type of parameters, only for those four types there. And it has a very similar syntax to values command, values to parameter name in inverted commas, the comma in square brackets, which again is only if you use an explicit plus sign, which I've never done. Then you have a numerical expression. Because you're using it with a numerical parameter, the value will be numerical. And then you have a description. And ARCHICAD will swap out for the user the number with the description you place. The secondary use is instead of using singular numbers with singular descriptions, you can replace that with an array. 
So let's have a look at how that works in practice. Now values2 will require an integer parameter. So we'll have desktop type as an integer. Now over in our parameter script, we'll go values2 desktop type 1 equals squared, 2 equals curved, 3 equals cut edge. Let's check our options and it's filled it out. Now what Archicad is doing in the background is it's taking my 1, 2 and 3 values, which is what desktop type is producing, and swapping that out for the description that I've placed here. So if I change this from squared to square, curve to rounded and so on, the value of this parameter hasn't changed. In this case, it's still one. All that's changed is what the user sees. And this is a lot more robust way of scripting selection lists. So now in my 2D script, it will be if desktop type equals one, two, or three. So that way I can change these definitions to anything I want. And my conditional statements, the rest of my script, doesn't have to change in order to still function properly and pick up those selections. Now, because I've changed the fundamental definition of my parameter, they've changed here, but I can just go and put them back to what they were. And there we go, it's working, no trouble. The other thing is that I can now add to that without any problems. I just add a new value for my parameter, which will be four. Remember the value is an integer. The text is just incidental to Archicad. It's purely for the user. Change this back to chamfered. That's method two of how to create a selection list. A variation on that is instead of using one, two, and three, in my master script, I'll create some constants. Now constants you use capitals. We'll go D type square equals one, D type rounded equals two, and D type chamfered equals three. So now I have constants in place of arbitrary numbers. So I'll just copy those across to my parameter script. and check my parameters and it's still working because what I've essentially done is even though that is now words it's a constant and it has the value of one now in my 2d script I can replace these arbitrary values with the correct constants we'll save check the result just run the parameter scripts of all of them and they're still working chamfered rounded squared now the beauty of this is if i change any of these definitions let's say we want them capitalized the value list updates without any impact to the code and if I change the text, once again, I'll run the parameter scripts just to show that they're still working. And it's updated. Now you may have noticed that this is still in lowercase. That's just a, a quirk because I actually haven't changed any of the letters. It doesn't update here. Let's have a look. So if I change this to squared, there we go. It just needs a little bit of a, a kick to, to change from uppercase to lowercase and vice versa if you actually haven't changed any of the text content itself. So that's a variation on the second method of creating a selection list. This is still not my preferred method. My preferred method is using arrays. So DIM, the way you declare an array, is found under expressions and functions, expressions, 
and here it is, dim. So the command line is dim, and that means array. The array name, how big that array is between square brackets. You can declare any number of arrays using the same dim statement just by separating them with a comma. And you can also go onto a new line separating with a comma. You can have one dimension and two dimensional arrays. As seen here, single brackets is a one dimension array. Dual brackets is a two dimension array. You can also declare them as fixed length. In this case, this first array var one has been declared with a fixed length value. So it might have say eight rows in it. Same with this two dimensional array. It's been declared as fixed length. Or if you leave inside the brackets blank, it's a variable length. And you can mix it up too. You can declare a fixed rows, but variable columns, or vice versa. For those of you completely unfamiliar with the concept of arrays, basically it's still a variable that you're declaring, but it can hold multiple values. So if you think of it like a spreadsheet, when you declare a variable, like I did with the desktop thickness variable, you could conceive of that as just a single cell in a spreadsheet. And when I call that variable, I get that value. Now, when I declare an array, a single dimension array would be like a single column of values. And when I refer to a number in that array, it always assumes I'm talking about the first column. If I talk about my array value four, it would go to the fourth cell in that row. A two dimensional array is both columns and rows. That's why you have the two square brackets. One is for the columns, one is for the rows. So let's have a look at how I utilize this command in practice. In our master script, we declare our arrays, one for the index values, which is a D type square rounded and chamfered that we see there and the other for the definitions or the text descriptions that we're going to use. And I'll just show how this works, how this ties together. So what we've got here, I've declared my arrays, their variable dimension arrays, and I'll just grow as I need them to. I've declared an index with a value of one. And for my first description, so ID equals one, I'm gonna say that value in that array is square. For the corresponding, oops, let's change that to be inside the square brackets. For the corresponding index, ID of one, I'm gonna use this value here that I've declared up here. And then I add one to my index. So now I can just copy this line down and change the values. So rounded, that's my next value. Copy the line down and that's my next value. It's also nice to just line up your text as well, make it easier to read. Now over on this side, instead of declaring everything in a line here, which is just in the parameter script, what I can do now is just throw in these arrays, desktop index and description. And if I check my parameters, it's all working. This is the most robust way of creating selection lists. This is an expandable list. I can insert something else nice and easily anywhere in that list. And my values will update without any extra work. All I need to do is change that array and everything else updates. For the eagle-eyed amongst you, you would have noticed my use of the colon in my array statement lines. And if you've watched my previous video, you'll see that the colon is used to declare a label when using go subroutines. So how did I use it here and not get an error? Well, if we go to our help GDL syntax and under line here, 
you can see that a colon is used for separating GDL statements in a line. So instead of having those array statements across multiple lines, I've shifted them on to one line and separated my carriage returns with a colon. Why didn't it have an error? We have a look here down at label. It says that any line can start with a label. A label is an integer number. So 1, 2, 3, 100, 200, 300, a whole number or a constant string. So text in inverted commas followed by a colon. So it's a very specific use of the colon. If I use a colon in association with known commands or variables, then it treats it as a new line. If I use a colon after a number or after a string in quotation marks, then it turns it into a label. So to just add a little bit of clarity to this, these lines that I declared, I could also declare them like this. That means the same thing. The reason I declare these particular types of lines using a colon is to keep the code nice and concise and make it more legible. That's the entire reason. Make it easier to read and understand. I don't do it very often because it doesn't always make it more legible. But in this case, grouping all these array statements together makes it read quite nicely. So what did we cover today? We covered limiting parameter inputs with the values command creating option lists with the values to command, declaring arrays and using arrays with the dim command, and also bringing multiple lines of code up onto one line using the colon separator. Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you learned something and I hope you give it a go yourself.